Welcome to the What is Stoicism podcast. In this episode, you'll hear a recent chat I had with Caleb Ontiveros for his Stoic Conversations podcast, where we discuss things like underrated Stoic ideas, Stoic exercises, and meditation. I haven't done many podcast interviews, but it was fun to get out of my comfort zone with this one. And as you'll hear, Caleb is a great interviewer. Hopefully I provided something of value for listeners. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Caleb Ontiveros for the Stoa Conversations podcast. Welcome to Stoa Conversations. In this conversation, I am speaking with Alan John from What is Stoicism, a popular website, newsletter, and podcast. Thanks for joining. Thanks, Caleb. Good to be here. So let's start with this broad question. What's your story? My story, um, my story in terms of being interested in Stoicism, philosophy in general, I was someone who for a long time just didn't have much exposure to philosophy at all to be able to appreciate the, the potential benefits of it and probably fell into that stereotypical mindset of thinking it was a kind of luxury or, you know, the domain of the intimidatingly intellectual mm -hmm. person who, you know, only those types of people were allowed to study or thing, something like that. But um, probably about 10 years ago, uh, that started to change a little bit when I was listening to Tim Ferriss's podcast, who I've been a fan of for a long time. And he started to talk more and more about Stoic philosophy around that time, particularly the work of Seneca. Um, but it wasn't until he sort of, Tim Ferriss spoke more of the, the therapeutic benefits of, of Stoicism that I decided to explore it more and eventually went on to reading William B. Irvine's book, A Guide to the Good Life, mm -hmm. which I think he had recommended. And around that time too, he had Derek Sivers on as a guest mm. a couple of times. Um, and his way of thinking really kind of opened my eyes to, to different ways of thinking really. So he was saying things like, you know, he, he was asked, who would you consider to be successful? And he was saying things like, uh, sort of going against the common conception of success as being wealth and fame and saying that to know who is successful, you have to know what their aims are. Um, for example, if Richard Branson set out to live a quiet life, but like a compulsive gambler, he can't stop creating companies. Yeah, yeah. He, he, it changes everything. You can't call him successful. So that was just one example of kind of things that made me think a bit differently. Um, but sort of the real point of that was that Derek Sivers also brought up a guide to the good life. And he said that, uh, you know, in that book, William B. Irvine says something like, if you ask a modern philosopher, what should I do with my life? They'll probably say something like, well, it depends what you mean by do. It depends what you mean by life, all this kind of stuff. Whereas you go back to the ancient philosophers, ask them what you should do with your life. They'll say, do this, do that, pursue this, don't pursue that, you know, exactly what you should do with your life. So yeah, it was getting the impression at that time that ancient philosophy is a practical thing. And uh, that's kind of why it interested me then to, to look into it more. Um, and this whole concept of, of learning how to live and then actually trying to live that way. So that's kind of my story. And it's maybe not the most common route into being interested in philosophy and but I think that's kind of the point that it's it's really open to every, everyone and can't benefit everyone. Yeah, I, I do like the Derek Sivers essay, uh, There Is No Speed Limit. I think that's one of my favorite essays about learning piano. How, do, how did you start working on the website then? What was the move from learning about stoicism to making that learning public, helping others learn about stoicism too? I think it started initially with creating the social media accounts just to try to share my thoughts on what I was discovering at the time, uh, sharing quotes that interested me. And then the more I did that, the more I wanted to go a bit deeper and actually write blog posts and just explore my thinking a bit, a bit more and, and clarify my thinking, uh, which I think writing really helps with mm -hmm. and to get that interaction with other people too. So I sort of felt that because I started being interested in philosophy out of nothing and really felt that it was beneficial 
it would be a lot of people out there who would be in the same position of perhaps never discovering it if they didn't, uh, you know, find it an easier path mm -hmm. into it. That was kind of the motivation behind it, as well as trying to further my own learning at the time. Right, right. How do you define stoicism? You know, what's your first pass definition at the at the life philosophy? I would say that my definition of stoicism seems to evolve over time and changes depending on what I'm reading. Um, and hopefully that's a good sign that I'm actually starting to understand it a bit. And uh, so to put it simply, I would probably say that it's a philosophy that gives us guidance that we can apply to give ourselves the best chance of living a good life. And that guidance is ancient wisdom from over 2,000 years ago that has been durable and useful enough and valued enough for people to actually want to preserve it until the current day. Um, it's a balance of theory and practice, so it's not just a set of doctrines to memorize and debate, but it's, it's a way of thinking and acting to be learned and applied in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of what it actually entails, obviously Stoicism centered around the four virtues of justice, temperance, wisdom, and courage. And, you know, the practical applications of those in terms of that our thoughts, intentions, and actions should all be carried out with, with reference to those virtues and things like treating others well, cultivating self-discipline, examining our judgments and facing our fears. Um, I also really like the, the three disciplines structure that Epictetus talks a lot about, and which I think can be helpful when defining stoicism. And maybe it's not just, maybe it's uh, something that's more accepted by people who, you know, been learning about stoicism for a little while. Maybe it's not something that you would dive straight into. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I think probably... Uh, we don't introduce the idea of the three disciplines initially in our in our first definition, which I think, uh, you know, if I'm ta ta talking to someone about stoicism, I'd say something very close to, to what you just said. You know, it's a life philosophy, a vision of what the good life is, and also practices about how to attain it, how to actually walk on that path, as it were. That includes uh, specific uh, exercises, you know, as Pierre Hadot called them, spiritual exercises. Uh, and of course, when you're thinking about the vision of the good life, you have this picture of it's a virtuous one. It's one that's lived in accordance with nature. And you can sketch that out, add more detail with the uh, four cardinal cardinal virtues. And then the three disciplines, I think, is a, a very useful idea for, you know, maybe once you have that idea of stoicism, how can you get deeper? How can you think about those three domains of desire, judgment, and action? You know, how can you think of those? as different knobs to be improving or uh, what have you, I think is a useful way to progress in stoicism. So that's certainly something we, we talk uh, talk about a lot um, as well after that that first introduction. Yeah, I think it's it's good that you mentioned Pierre Hadot there because his book, The Inner Citadel, really goes into great depth on the three disciplines, and that's probably something that's opened my eyes to to how useful that can be quite recently too, you know, it's not something yeah. that I think I would have really appreciated a few years ago. It's quite a, it's a, well, it's a very in-depth book and not, not an easy read by any means, but once you kind of have a good grinding and then dive in, start diving into that stuff, it really starts to make sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an excellent book. I love, I love Pierre Hedo's book. I think it's one of those that has influenced many people in modern stoicism, uh, especially from Donald Robertson to Ryan Holiday. Yeah, I think if you uh, if you've read the Meditations by Marcus Aurelius too, and you probably think that, or at least I thought that I knew what it was about until I read Pierre Hadot's Inner Citadel, and it really sort of made me realize that a lot of hidden patterns in Marcus Aurelius's Meditations, and that he's basically basically completing a philosophical exercise for the whole, or for most of his book. Right, right. And and how much influence Epictetus had on him and how he's thinking about yeah. those three disciplines for Epictetus. So I'm quoting Epictetus, probably 
rephrasing Epictetus in his own words at other points as another thing that Ed- is very good at. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and I think one one nice fact about Hado also is that he just spends so much time quoting Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius. So I think it, even if it might be, although it is somewhat dense, it, I think it can be for some people useful to read along in the Inner Citadel with meditations if you're struggling with it, because he will show you some of those connections between those different passages, uh, and then with just a little bit of commentary, you know, what's what's behind these. Otherwise, short lines, short statements from Marcus Aurelius. How's it grounded in Epictetus? How's it grounded in these other other Stoic ideas? Yeah, definitely adds a whole new layer to it. I mean, you can read Marcus Aurelius's Meditations as a standalone book and still get a lot of value from it. Mm-hmm. A lot of the, the short passages are, are very direct and self-explanatory, but when you look at the next layer, in terms of those explanations and how they come from Epictetus and how they adhere to a, a certain structure, then yeah, it's it's all the more useful. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Well, one question I have that uh, I'm curious to get your take on is, you know, so what's a Stoic idea that is and be underrated among people who know about Stoicism? They've heard about, you know, they have some sense of what the philosophy is. Maybe they started to practice it. Uh, what idea sort of come, comes to mind for you for you there? So one thing I've been thinking about recently is the importance of intention. And I'm not sure if this is widely underrated, but it's, it's possibly neglected as a topic as it, it doesn't sound very exciting. Mm-hmm. Certainly underrated it myself. But so for the Stoics, it wasn't, wasn't always results of their actions that mattered, but actually the intention to do good with those actions. And that's probably something that, again, comes from a good explanation by Pierre Hadot. You know, and given the externals and the uncertainties that can interfere with any action we take, we can't always guarantee the success of an action, even if, you know, taking that action was up to us. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of the success of an action, the Stoics would probably place a greater focus on the intention behind it. And specifically, the, the intention was one of virtue or moral good, rather than some kind of pleasure or external gain. And so it's the awareness of the, the value of doing good for its own sake that can can really increase peace of mind and which ironically can lead to more effective actions when the, when the outcome isn't a source of tension. You know, you're, you're not so attached to the outcome that it becomes a, an issue when you're actually trying to, to achieve that outcome. Uh, so essentially within the intention of doing good that virtue is found for Stoics, as far as I understand it, and there's a, a line from Seneca that kind of that where he says that the uh, reward for all virtues is lies in the virtues themselves. You know, the wages of a good deed is to have done it, and it be signs like it promotes a kind of apathy when it comes to fulfilling intentions or you know successful actions. But um, you know, like you would just give something a shot and give up if it doesn't succeed, but Right, right. Intentions to do good are, you know, also determined, um, are also determined and and prepared to face obstacles too. So, you know, there's a kind of perseverance there too. If something does fail, yeah. So, that that, that was kind of something that I underrated for for quite a while, and I think it's it's more important than I thought it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I suppose on one hand, of course, you have the idea there are some things that are up to you, others that are not what it is up to you, your decisions, your judgments, see how you use your attention. And that's always a good uh, idea to keep in mind. And, and one additional sort of fact that follows from that is when you're thinking about action, interacting with the world, what is up to you is just going to be that dec- decisions you have, what you intend to accomplish with your actions, not so much the results themselves as you say and i do think there's a, there's a, a nice link there too i think between some concerns that some people have that stoicism might be too passive or how do you relate to this idea about uh okay i understand that i'm separate from externals but how do i relate to externals and that's that link at least one of the links perhaps is intention intent intending to uh, bring about good effects 
by managing indifference well. Um, I think I think that's a that's that's a good always a good point to highlight. I think that's kind of where the the reserve clause comes from too, isn't it? It's you know I will complete this action unless something prevents me. Mm-hmm. So there's always that kind of mel- mental um, mental note before undertaking an action that it, it could fail. Uh, and so obviously to be prepared for that, uh, which is is useful. Yeah, I think it gives you a, a kind of ease, or a more almost a, a more directed way to interact with the world. Directed may not be may not be the, the the best word, but there's a sense in which you're given that you're less invested in the outcome. Now you can, of course, focus on making whatever decision uh, is best in the moment, and that and that's sort of all you need to do. And you know, let the cards fall where they may can be can be very freeing. I think. Yeah, this can be misunderstood. Um, just when you said about passivity previously, there, um, I think some people possibly think that the acceptance of an outcome is passivity, whereas it's maybe more helpful to think of it as accepting what can't be changed as a platform to then focus on what can be changed. I don't know if you've find that people think that too Mm -hmm. you know is acceptance being passivity yeah on occasion i think people will make that move i probably more often critics of stoicism i think or maybe someone just very who's at the very beginning stages figuring out what's going on and then uh yeah i think people people can can make that move for sure the other thing that i think what you just said just brought to mind is it helps make sense of the famous line that you know the obstacle is the way, right? You know, the impediment to action advances action. Why is that? Because it's just a fact that you need to deal with, right? And then your uh, how you make the your next decision you needs to take that into account. How you respond to whatever happened, that's uh, that's what's next. And you can take into account maybe even the benefits of of whatever obstacle arises. I think you, there's some nice examples of this in business. I think where people who are both uh, successful business, skilled, and also have a lot of fun. They often have this approach to adversity, where if someone sees like a bad market outcome, they're init- they're initially going to think about you know oh, how exposed am I to this? You know how ruinous is this bad market downturn going to be? Whereas others might think, okay, this is just a fact. The market uh, took a turn for the worse. That's going to open up all these other opportunities that I wasn't thinking about before. Even even if it is going to come with serious costs. Right, it's just that other that other frame that is useful to get into. Usually, useful to get into uh, faster than than not. Uh, I think uh, that's a, a useful example for me. Yeah, I've heard uh, Donald Robertson talk along those lines, where he says that you know an awfulness of a situation. The proof that that comes from our judgments is that one person can react one way, and a different person can react a different way to the exact same situation. So what's you know, the situation is the same, but mm-hmm. difference comes in the judgment of the different person. So I think that's a useful, useful way to think about that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. What sort of stoic exercises or uh, I suppose principles do you, do you apply? Find yourself applying uh, in your daily life. <clears throat> so the thing that really helps me do that, um, first of all, is is daily writing. Um, and writing my daily newsletter because for that I generally focus on one idea per day and that's very helpful because it's one idea that can be practiced in that day and it's usually usually around 300 words and obviously I produce that primarily for the benefit of subscribers but I find that it also serves as a kind of ritual for me and that whatever I'm writing about is, you know, the one thing that I can then try to apply as a principle. So I try to cover a comprehensive range of themes each day and repeat those regularly in the hope that it's an effective way to really facilitate the practice of stoicism in a way that kind of seems effortless in a way, but really it's not it's, it's repetition and it's it's writing about things that i've 
I've read and and learned and try to trying to explain it to others too. Uh, so not only does a, a reader digest a new idea each day, they're also encouraged to reflect on how they're actually applying the idea in their lives and how might go about improving that. So obviously I'm doing the same thing while I'm trying to provide that um, to them. But aside from that, I try to try to make decisions with reference to the, the Stoic virtues as much as possible, separate what's within my control from what isn't. Mm -hmm. and really try to place as much focus on, on the present as I can so that I'm not wasting too much time regretting the past or worrying about the future, which I probably was much more prone to do before we got into practice stoicism. All those things can be pretty difficult to do at times, but I've noticed that if you do start, start small by routinely doing them, uh, especially when you're calm and relatively unbothered, then you become more able to do them when it's more difficult or when, you know, when you're faced with a problem. Um, you know, for example, you start se separating what you can control from what you can't. When you break a glass, I think was the example Epictetus used. And if you find that to be helpful, you can progress to more important things. Mm -hmm. um, it becomes easier to do that. The other thing I like to practice is the, the exercise of objective representation, where you try to describe things in the most unemotional, matter of fact way possible as a means of decatastrophizing worries or seeing an objective desire for what it really is. Basically, you build up a lot of stories about things in our minds or we're directly fed those stories and it can be helpful to, to try to see those kinds of judgments and or see through them and get a bit of distance from them. And I think that, that exercise really helps. Yeah, yeah. The classic example, or one of the classic examples, I suppose, of that is Marcus Aurelius in Meditation 613, where he talks about the purple robe and how it's nothing more than the uh, some sheep's wool and the blood of a shellfish. And you know, as you say, I think it's useful to do that sort of thing when we've built up stories around you know, some object of our desire or some thing that has to do with, in Marcus Aurelius's case, status and the fact that you know, he's trying to think about how to make excellent decisions as an emperor uh, without losing you know, his head like many of the former Roman emperors may have in the face of like, all the signs of opulence, power, uh, and so on. So I think that's, um, that's an excellent one for decision-making generally uh and then also if you think about catastrophizing you know trying to to the extent that you can describe things in objective terms without making unnecessary value judgments that's uh, uh always a good exercise how do you think about applying those sort of in day-to-day -day moments either that or of course other stoic principles as well but i think you know, many people they'll say i understand i have the principles but I'm struggling to use them when it when it matters. I either forget or they're not in the front of my mind for whatever reason. Yeah, what, I don't know if you have any advice or just noted things in your in your own life that uh, might be might be useful to to know about. It can be difficult. It definitely can. But just from what I was saying previously, I think the smaller you can start, really, you know, if you can really just start small do one small thing per day as long as you can. You know, in practical terms, it might be a, a case of, of writing something in the morning, journaling your thoughts, um, you know, writing down what you recently read about stoicism or a principle that has resonated with you or, or something like that, and then just focus on that one thing for that day. One of the things that the Stoics did was condense a lot of the larger points and principles in this shorter phrases to make them more memorable, mm -hmm. which is very helpful. Um, I think that's a good exercise for, for anyone to do, but there's also obviously ready-made sort of aphorisms from Epictetus and Seneca and Marcus Aurelius that you can, you can use yourself or note down in your own you know, your own notebook and, and revise over those things that they might 
come back to you more readily when when you need them. I think if it can be difficult to see how you can do that when you're just starting out. But I think that's one of the main points is that stoicism really is a, a practical philosophy and it has to be applied that once you begin to learn something, you then have to have the the inclination to then, you know, try to practice it. Yeah. But as I say, you know, it's not going to all happen at once. And if you can start with one thing and focus on that for a while, it becomes more habitual, I think. Yeah, I, th- I think so. I think that the idea of always starting small, being specific, and then that other thought of just keeping those principles in mind, internalizing them, either remembering phrases from the Stoics themselves, putting them into your own words. You know, they advocated keeping those principles ready at hand for a, a reason, just as having uh, them be useful rules of thumb, reminders for what to do when an obstacle arises or what have you. So just I think a quick example of that is I love Marcus Aurelius's aphorism, you know, the universe is transformation, life is opinion. It's very short, uh, easy enough to remember, but has when, as I think, so much of the philosophy in it. You know, the universe is transformation, the fact of change, things are temporary, always moving, always in flux, a uh, reminder not to grip onto things too tightly. And then you have the life is opinion, that's just the stoic view of emotions, the fact that interpretation shapes how we experience events. And you can also read into it the uh, importance of knowledge, making that move from opinion to uh, having beliefs that aren't not merely opinions, but true in a sense that they're justified and get at the root nature of reality to the extent, extent that you can. And when you can't, maybe suspending uh, your your desire so that so short but there's a lot there and I think use, useful to come back to when an event comes up or even just during those transition moments uh, in a day uh, when you have a, a time to pause yeah for sure uh, there's one that stuck with me from Marcus Aurelius to quite a short one but there's more behind it um, he says if it's not right don't do it if it's not the truth don't say it your impulses should be under your control. So, you know, in general, it's just good advice on its own, and a good reminder to to do the right thing and be honest at all times, which is great. But it's also that kind of prompt to, to look a bit deeper and understand, well, what is the right thing and, and what is the truth? And, you know, to examine your impulses and impressions and, and to ensure you're applying your ability to, to reason and, you know, as the Stoics might characterize it and, to do that as best as you can. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think a lot, a lot of those lines are are a lot deeper than they appear, even though they can be useful on their own too. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. But so a few of your newsletters stuck out to me, so I'd love to ask you about them and have a have you say a little bit more about them. So one of one of them is on widening your domain of being. You know what what is what does that mean? How does that uh, connect to philosophies I, of life. I would like to say that I had come up with that phrase myself. I didn't. <laughs> um, I, got, I got that particular phrase from Nan Shepherd, who was a Scottish mountaineer and uh, a poet who basically used her hill walking experiences as inspiration for her writing. Um, so she died in about 1981. I think she's currently, her image is currently featured on the Bank of Scotland, five pound notes, but basically she's best known for a book called *The Living Mountain*, um, which is about her, you know, her hill walking and things like that. So she said um, she's talking about you know the the mountain range and being in nature and things, and she said that simply to look on anything such as a mountain with the love that penetrates to its essence is to widen the domain of being in the vastness of non-being, man has no other reason for his existence. And so when I, when I came across that, it really reminded me of the, the stoic notion that our life is what our thoughts make it. It also sort of invokes the, you know, the importance of fully focusing on 
the present to really experience each moment to its fullest. Um, and especially when you're surrounded by nature, but and the simple, you know, the simple but amazing things that are easy to miss due to your familiarity mm -hmm. with them, uh, which which can happen every day. So by by being grateful for everything and to take in as much as possible, it widens your domain of being and, and broadens your perspective of life. And that's that was really inspiration behind that one. Yeah, I love it. I like I it reminds me of the I think sort of like the posture that you see it in Marcus Aurelius too around how, how he will note what's beautiful in nature, how things are connected to a much larger whole. You know, he even mentions you know, the flex of of foam on a boar's mouth and how that's connected to, of course, the boar, but also now the boar plays a whole role in its ecosystem, as well as uh, different facts like the cracks of uh, on top of a loaf of a bread and how that too has its own beauty. And if you can see things properly, if you're tuned to them properly, you'll see uh, how, how beautiful they are as things that fit into a much, much larger whole. Yeah, it's kind of like the, uh, you know, the more simpler things that you can notice or take joy in and the more there is to take joy in, which is there are more sources of joy on a daily basis if you're, if you're noticing more of what's readily available. Yeah, I don't know if I'm reading the phrase correctly, but to, to me, wi you know, widening your domain of being means maybe being, is being more open to those kinds of experiences, recognizing that often we have a, a sort of narrow perspective on things that'll cause us to miss uh, just how uh, valuable or good people, things, the art is that surrounds us. Yeah, I think nature, that's exactly it. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Well, how is philosophy just like gardening? This one's probably kind of a cliche. <laughs> It's like, just like a gardener tends to their plants daily, the philosopher can cultivate their thoughts and attitudes regularly, that kind of thing. You know, one involves digging in the dirt and the other one's digging into your own mind and garden needs attention to care or attention and care to grow, but so does our, our inner world. Um, I think Epictetus said that um, no great thing is created suddenly any more than a bunch of grapes or a fig. Um, let it blossom, then bear, bear fruit, then ripen. So just like the gardener has to patiently tend their plants over time, we have to be patient with ourselves as we practice philosophy. It's kind of like what we were talking about earlier. You can't suddenly mm -hmm. expect to have all the answers to, or be free from negative thoughts overnight, but it takes the time and effort to, to cultivate a healthy mind. So, you know, you know a few other things that, the garden can bring you joy and nourishment in the shorter term, but so too you can practice some philosophy for self improvement. It's not all, it's not all long term. You know, there's shorter term gains to be had there too. So you can learn to be more present, and appreciate the little things as we're talking about too, and mm -hmm. uh, be kinder to ourselves and others. You know, there's just things you can start doing straight away. And um, yeah, obviously the gardener has plenty of. Um, unexpected things that they have to deal with too. So mm -hmm. they'll be following Epictetus' advice as well as with philosopher and that that's not what happens, but how you react to it that matters. You know, if there's some kind of infestation in their garden plot or something like that, then you know what's happened. They can't control that, but they can control how they respond to it. So yeah, I think that's the, the parallels between gardening and practicing philosophy. Um. When I was younger, I w would help a older neighbor a garden, and it was a, a at once a bit of a chore, but also uh, very pleasurable. I, found, I thought it was a, a, a sometimes very, very fun as well. And I realized it has a social aspect, gardening, or at least it can have a social aspect. I suppose people approach it differently, and perhaps, perhaps there's that connection in philosophy too, where you see so much philosophy happens in dialogue, like what we're doing now. But of course, you have the earlier examples that the Stoics would have been familiar with, examples of Socrates talking to his friends and thinking through uh, what you know, what their thoughts and subjecting themselves to 
criticism inquiry. Yeah, I think that's something that uh, is probably underrated quite a bit is that, you know, the social aspect of uh, philosophy and the fact that it's not just a, an isolated pursuit. You know, it's really to do with the, you know, the virtue of justice and community and tr treating others well and making your, your actions with reference to, to the common good, which mm -hmm. doesn't just benefit other people, but benefits you also. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. How is stoicism a refined kind of happiness? Um, I think this one may have been, I think the title of this one is actually a re refined kind of selfishness, possibly, which I took from Anthony DeMello, um, his book, Awareness, I think it was. Uh, so he basically says that even people seeking to benefit others are really seeking to benefit themselves. Um, not only not only we should we bear that in mind, but we should accept it rather than you know treating it with cynicism. Um, so he says charity is really self interest masquerading under the form of altruism. Uh, and there's two types of selfishness. The first type is where you give yourself the pleasure of pleasing yourself, and that's self centeredness. Whereas the second is giving yourself the pleasure of pleasing others, which is a re more refined kind of selfishness. Mm -hmm. So as the Stoics would maybe say, when you try to inflict harm on someone else, you're actually harming yourself because you're seeing in your character in a way, you know, and, and making yourself a worse person. But the same applies when you benefit someone else and that you're benefiting yourself too by improving your character uh, and actually getting a good feeling from it in the process. So I think that's the, the idea of a refined kind of selfishness is, is Anthony DeMello puts it and, you know, to please someone else and see how pleasurable it is, it's kind of a win-win a situation. I suppose they, if you think about the account of virtue, well, what is the virtuous life? It's a happy one. And of course, it's in our self-interest to be happy. So you could think of that as doing what in fact benefits us and that having then significant overlap with what benefits others where at once individuals but also of course people who are living in these lar larger communities and that's that might be maybe another underrated aspect of stoicism because it sort of challenges this both stoicism and i should say many other ancient forms of virtue ethics challenge the common dichotomy between you know altruism and egoism uh that's you you'll usually see both i think in popular discussions of ethics, but also, of course, in, in some of the key main ethical competitors to virtue ethics as well. There's a stark divide between what's in your self-interest uh, and uh, what's more altruistic, but many of the ancients didn't see things quite quite in that light. Yeah, yeah, that's that's well put. So how do you, do you, how do you think about finding that place where it's not that first kind of selfishness, but it's the second kind. How do you think about being being that kind of kind of person? Maybe this comes comes down to that stoic virtue of, of justice. You know, how do you think about approaching the that uh, developing that that trait? Yeah, it's kind of a tricky one too. It's it's hard to know what the balance is sometimes. We we'll go back to the, the sort of the domain of of action. I think that sort of the instruction there was that more or less all your actions should be done with reference to the common good, essentially. But it's hard to know, you know, sort of the idea of, of ego, as you were talking about too, is what are your intentions behind the action that you're performing? Are you genuinely trying to treat someone with kindness, with fairness, or are you doing it for some kind of personal gain or reputational gain? You know, which if it happens as a result of that, it may not be the worst thing in the world, but if that's the main motivation, then perhaps it's not the best intention to, to begin with. Yeah, yeah, I suppose you always have that reminder. You want right action, also right intention at the right time. And thinking I, uh, thinking about things not just from okay what are the right you know what's the right thing to do but also am I intent do I have the right intentions and of course those are going to going to come together um, 
but uh, perhaps it's it's easier, I think, for many to think about what the intentions are to begin with, and then given that those are in fact the intentions, putting in the relevant effort or developing the relevant skills to do the do the right thing. So, something else you've thought a lot about is stoic meditation uh, and different exercises, guided exercises people can do to practice stoicism. So I suppose the first question there is, what, what, what do you think makes stoic meditation distinct from other forms of meditation? Why do people find it uh, so valuable? Probably sound a bit repetitive here, but probably the, the actual intention behind stoic meditation is maybe what makes it distinct from, from other forms. Um, you know, with certain types of mindful, mindfulness meditation, you know, as far as I understand, there shouldn't really be a great intention when you begin the session of that. You know, you're not necessarily making an effort to empty your mind or achieve a, a state of serenity as much as you're just experiencing the moment and and the feelings in your body and your environment and things like that. But I think that the ancient Stoics meditation meant more of a conscious contemplation of, of philosophical principles and attempt to create uh, an inner dialogue that allowed them to reflect on their impressions and, and form judgments based on those. So uh, I think it can be a really important part of a, a philosophical practice because it's it's another sort of vehicle for repetition, if you like. Uh, it helps to really cement the type of thinking you're trying to adopt from Stoicism. So, um, you know, it can take many forms too. So you, you could med meditate on a, a stoic text you've just read or, or what your intentions are for that day or, you know, how you've reacted to a certain situation. The possibilities are endless really, but mm -hmm. the point is that it helps you get into the habit of applying stoic principles to your thinking. So maybe that comes into, you know, the more, the more you learn about stoicism, the more you can meditate on how your own thoughts and actions could be improved by following the principles, which, which then gives you the platform to, to go on and implement that. So what I've tried to do with some of my content and, and you know, what, what you've done brilliantly with, with Stoa is sort of combine mindfulness with stoic meditation and, you know, give people the opportunity to be guided in the practice. And that can be really helpful because people don't have to, you know, to figure that out for themselves. Yep. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. The purpose behind Stoic meditation is always central. I think maybe you can think of mindfulness. People do mindfulness meditation for a whole range of different reasons, sometimes to address just a negative emotion, remove that negative emotion from their life, other times to improve productivity, uh, or perhaps there's a spiritual purpose as well. And then with, with Stoic meditation, it's always geared towards its purpose, its telos if you will, just as becoming more stoic. What does that mean? It means becoming more resilient, of course, but also developing excellent character and doing the, doing these kinds of exercises to develop one's mind that involves you know, increasing your attention and awareness, but also thinking about, uh, as you say, you know, what are the decisions that I'm going to be making in my life? How am I going to handle different circumstances? And using meditation as a gym to think through different uh, situations that might arise and how how to handle them properly when they do or if they do. Yeah, it's, I think it's an underrated element to a philosophical practice too, you know, just taking that time and space to, to really contemplate what your intentions are and where you are in your journey and where you're trying to go and, uh, you know, what you need to do better at. You don't always... It's not always easy to take that time if you, you know, even just 10 minutes a day can, mm -hmm. can really help, I think. Right, right. Yeah, I suppose if for stoic meditation, you don't always need to, although it can be helpful too, but you don't always need to, you know, have that cushion, make sure you're in a, a silent place. That sort of thing does help, but it's the sort of thing I think many stoic exercises, many meditative exercises you can do while walking, while doing the dishes or something like this sort. And it's a sort of thing that you really do want to enter into your ordinary life right because that's where that's where it matters so there's there's a, there's that point as well awesome what's one of your uh, favorite stoic quotes or 
uh, favorites, favorite Stoic lines uh, re recently that, that you've been thinking about that you want to you want to end on. Aside from the one I mentioned earlier, which which is one of my favorites, but there's also um, one from Seneca, uh, which probably discovered fairly recently and just as seemed to have stuck with me. So the background is that you know in ancient times philosophy was sometimes referred to as as a medicine for the soul. But, you know, in one of his letters, Seneca plays on this a bit to explain how philosophy can not only heal, but also be a kind of pleasure. So he says, the mind must be forced to make a beginning. From then on, the medicine is not bitter. For just as soon as it is curing us, it begins to give pleasure. One enjoys other cures only after health is restored, but a draft of philosophy is at the same time wholesome and pleasant. So yeah, I just, just love that idea of a draft of philosophy. It's something that you, right? You know, you drink basically every day, and it can be healing, but also pleasant at the same time. Mm. Excellent. That's great. Thanks so much for coming on. No worries. Thanks for having me. This is great.